Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're going to talk about the coronavirus, where it came from, what is the latest information about how we can stop it, and how to prepare for the next epidemic. With us today is science journalist Deborah McKenzie. She writes for New Scientist magazine, published in the United Kingdom. And her book, one of the first books to come out about this virus, is... COVID-19, the pandemic that never should have happened, and how to stop the next one. Today, we're going to focus on the origin of the coronavirus, what we know about it, and of course, how to stop the next pandemic. And once again with us today is Deborah, Deborah McKenzie. She's a science journalist, writes for New Scientist magazine. So, Deborah, let me ask you a question. When you were a youth, a young kid, what steered you in the direction of science? Well, I think it was just that I was interested in the nature I saw around me. Um, I was born in Toronto. It's a big city. But, uh, you know, there were things in the backyard. There were bugs. There were plants. And there was the Eaton's catalog, which had this really interesting-looking chemistry set for sale. And I absolutely wanted that chemistry set. It seemed to me that, you know, that was how I could maybe do something important and learn about all this great stuff that I was sort of, you know, that was around me. That's actually the earliest I can remember thinking about it. And what steered you in the direction of science journalism? Because you're a, a science writer for New Scientist magazine. Well, um, in my freshman year uh, as an undergraduate biology major, um, a friend of mine came up to me after a lab we were in and said, Deb, I borrowed a car. I'm going to drive to Halifax. This was a two-hour drive. This was a big thing for us um, because a guy named David Suzuki, he's a geneticist out in the West Coast, but he's giving a talk on how scientists should, you know, communicate science to the public. And I thought, ooh, that sounds good. So we went and we listened to him, and he was very inspiring. Of course, David Suzuki then went on to become a very well-known science popularizer in his own right. Um but later on, after I finished my Ph.D. work, I sort of thought, well, you know, I could do that. I can I can actually write. Um, maybe I should try doing that instead of, you know, continuing with research. Um, and so I did, and it worked out, and I discovered that I could write about a much wider range of subjects than I got to study as a scientist. And, and I was a, a bit of a glutton for, for that kind of thing, so it appealed to me, and I kept doing it. Okay. Well, let's just jump right into your book, COVID-19. The pandemic that never should have happened and how to stop the next one. So let's begin with how it all started. You say that when it was first noticed, it could have been manageable, that the pandemic in some sense didn't have to happen. So what went wrong? Well, I think what really went wrong was that we allowed that virus to jump into humans in the first place. Um, that group of viruses had been discovered and, and characterized. In 2013, um, a virology lab in Wuhan, unusually, uh, actually published a report saying, look, there, there is this virus in bats. It's closely related to SARS, and as you may recall, SARS was a very closely related virus to COVID-19 that caused um, a worldwide epidemic in uh, in 2003. It didn't quite go pandemic. It didn't spread quite that readily. But we found related viruses, and in 2013, this lab published results showing that there were viruses in the bats that were already perfectly capable of infecting human airway cells. They didn't need to do any more evolving. They were they were happy just to just to infect human cells right up. At that point, that should have been a clue that, you know, humans maybe should have started avoiding those bats. And yet the scientists themselves are saying, look, bats and bat-derived products are for sale on markets. Um, we've really got to shut this down. This is really dangerous. And I don't think anybody really took that seriously enough. It shouldn't have been a problem. I mean, bats carry lots of nasty viruses. For example, in North America, um, insect-eating bats like this carry rabies. Um, and the number of people who catch rabies for bats are vanishingly small. It's extremely rare. If you leave the bats be, you don't tend to catch viruses from them. And that should have been the case. We, we should have heeded those warnings earlier. Now, tell us about the wet markets, which deal with exotic animals. Some people say that we should shut them all down because, of course, where do these diseases come from? 60% of all diseases, roughly speaking, come from the animal kingdom. But what are your thoughts? 
Well, in this case, I don't see a lot of compelling evidence that that particular market um, was necessarily the source of the bat material. I mean, it might have been. But of the first 41 cases that the Chinese reported, um, only a third of them, um, well, a full, fully a third of them, were not related at all to that market, and, and only two-thirds of them were. Markets are also a place for human contact. Um, it was being spread human to human by that point. Um, it wasn't that those 41 people all caught it separately from bats. Um, mostly they were catching it from each other. And as we discovered later, you know, a lot of other people in Wuhan had already caught it too that we weren't aware of. At that time, the Chinese weren't fully aware of the extent to which this virus, you know, can make you sick and, and pass on through you and, and not even cause any symptoms. So, you know, who knows? Um, what the role of that, that uh, market was. There are other ways of encountering that derived products. Um, in China, there is, for example, an apparently quite popular traditional medication derived from bat feces that you put in your eye to cure eye problems. Um, that could very well have virus in it, I mean, possibly viable virus. Nobody's really looked. But I don't think we can necessarily say that this particular infection came from the market. It might just have been spread there a lot. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's, you know, we, we do know that other infections um, are spread via these live markets. Bird flu is the really worrying one. Um, the H7N9 bird flu that uh, was a bit of a problem in, in 2013 and a few years after that um, was almost exclusively found on markets. And Chinese cities discovered that when they shut down their live markets, they stopped getting cases of that virus. So, you know, they pose other problems. And, and really, I think one should look into the hygiene of, of our entire food chain, including markets like that, to stop things like that happening. But, you know, when it comes to viruses from bats, um, it might have been that market in this case. It might not have been. The, the, the evidence isn't clear. But we should definitely find ways to keep material from bats from, from getting into any kind of human contact. Now, as I understand, the Wuhan wet market did not deal in horseshoe bats at all. Zero. So, in other well, words, the only know. horseshoe bat, well, the only horseshoe bat that scientists confirmed were in the Wuhan Institute, which is at biosafety level four, so they deal with these very, very dangerous viruses. And a case has been made that it was accidentally released from that laboratory. Well, let's take a short commercial break, and after the break, we're going to continue the discussion of a new book. The book is called COVID-19, The Pandemic That Never Should Have Happened and How to Stop the Next One. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Once again with us today is Deborah McKenzie, author of a new book, COVID-19. The Pandemic That Never Should Have Happened, and How to Stop the Next One. Well, as I understand, about 96% of the genes of the coronavirus are identical to the genes found in the horseshoe bat. So people have narrowed their interest in that bat, but that bat apparently was not dealt with, was not being sold in the wet markets at all. The only place you would find the horseshoe bat were in the Wuhan Virology Institute. And so some people say, aha, two plus two is four. The only corona, the only uh, horseshoe bats that were in the area, you have to go 900 miles to Yunnan province. In other words, the only corona bats that were there were at the Institute. Two plus two is four. So maybe it was accidentally released from the laboratory. But what are your thoughts? Certainly four, but, but that second two is not actually true. <laughs> I hate to say it. Um, that, that species of bat lives in the wild in Hubei province. It, it's fairly common across China. But what about the people who say that since the Hunan Virology Institute had these viruses, and since that was the epicenter of this worldwide pandemic, maybe it came, uh, came, was accidentally released? What are your thoughts one way or the other? Well, first of all, there's no evidence for that. As you say, um, the, they, they've isolated some viruses of a plethora of viruses. There are lots and lots of different kinds of these viruses in the bats. They've isolated a few of them. They sequenced a few of them. 
Of those that they've sequenced, the closest one is 96%. That's not the same. In fact, those two things have been on a separate evolutionary path for about 40 years, um, which doesn't mean that the virus that caused COVID-19 didn't come from the same bat. It very probably did. But it does mean that none of the viruses that they isolated and sequenced are that virus. That doesn't mean it might not have escaped in some other way. Um, of course, most of the virus that they study in that lab is brought back dead in a preservative from the bat caves that they study. Um, as you mentioned, they are several hundred kilometers away. But that's just because it's a convenient cave in order to catch a lot of these bats in order to do a lot of samples. Um, it is a common species, as I say, across China. Um, basically, there is no evidence that any of the specific viruses they studied in that lab, um, A, were alive, and B, could have gotten out, as you say. It's a BSL-4. Um, the thing is that that lab will have records. Uh, we can look into that. There should be a fully transparent investigation. That's the good thing about labs. You can do that. They've got records. But the thing is that, you know, what gets me is that these people were trying to warn everybody. It seems a little unfair to accuse them of being the source of the virus. And they were writing papers with things in the title like poised for human emergence and poses a pandemic threat, you know? They were, they were trying to, to warn us about how dangerous they were. And at the same time, um, you certainly have in Wuhan at least one medication being sold. I don't know that there weren't bats being sold on, on that market. Um, it's illegal. So it's uh, entirely possible that it was under the table. Anybody who was doing it went to ground pretty quickly. So I don't know that there were or weren't bats being sold on that market. But there certainly is a medication based on bat poop, if you will, um, that's very commonly used across China. In fact, you can buy it on the Internet, um, which, you know, could very well have some non-neutralized um, virus persisting in it. And this is used to, to cause, to, to create a, a, a water decoction that you put in your eye in order to treat eye ailments. And the eye is full of the ACE2 protein, which is the receptor that this virus uses to get into cells. In fact, uh, virologists are beginning to think the eye is really where this virus prefers to infect us. So, you know, if, if you were in the habit of putting, you know, bat poop-derived products in your eye, um, it's not surprising where if, if, if occasionally maybe one might have some live virus left in it and it might get out. I don't know if it's any easier to say that that is a likely source of this virus than to say that a highly contained BSL-4 lab full of scientists who are desperately trying to warn the world about these viruses was the source. But I do know we can investigate and we can find out what the truth might have been. Well, recently, um, people have tried to track exactly when we had patient zero, that is, the first person to be infected. Uh, some people think it was December, November. But now there's a new study done by satellite data photographing the parking lots around the hospitals, and they find a spike, a sudden dramatic spike in the number of cars stationed at the hospital, ambulance, trucks, and so on and so forth. And they find that you have to go all the way back to October. And so what are your thoughts about the fact that maybe this had been spreading much earlier than people had suspected, that maybe October or even before that, there could have been this infection starting from patient zero? What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, the scientists I know who are experts in interpreting satellite images were pretty rude about that story. Um, it, it's pretty easy to attribute almost anything you want to images like that. Um, there are three lines of evidence. There's that. Secondly, there's the fact that the genetics on this outbreak have been very clear. Um, the first few cases that were reported in China, I mean, all of those things were, were sequenced, and there was virtually no difference between them. We can pretty much tell when those viruses had a common ancestor, and it was very, very unlikely to have been before early November. Um, and we have information uh, that the earliest known case, um, when the, uh, all the records are tracked back, was the 17th of November, and that fits perfectly with the genetic information. But what really is damning to me was that I looked at that data in that paper in, in some um, detail, and what you may not be aware of, because this for some reason is not a very commonly recognized virus, but there's something called respiratory syncytial virus. Um, it's the single largest cause for hospitalization in, in very young children. Um, and when you look at all those curves for the amount of cars in the parking lot in six different hospitals in Wuhan, 
uh, they're up and down, they're all over the place. I mean, one is tempted to think that the uh, resultant curve that the uh, scientists plotted through that mess, um, showing a bit of a peak sort of in, in October, um, not August as, as was reported, but sort of September, October, um, more like October, um, when you plotted, plotted them together, was not really representative of much because all the different hospitals were having peaks at completely different times. But one of the reasons there was a bit of a peak at that point was be, because the uh, the biggest children's hospital in Wuhan had a huge peak in parking in its parking lot at precisely the time you expect there to be the annual respiratory syncytial virus epidemic, which is not surprising at all. So that seems to have driven that apparent peak. Nothing else in that data really provides much evidence at all that this was circulating as early as October or as they tried to claim August. Um, the, the data just, you know, frankly does not take account of other known viral um, phenomena. I mean, I even found the papers that the local medical researchers had written about when the RSV spike is in, in that province. And yeah, it's then, same as it is many other places. So, you know, of course there were a lot of cars in the parking lot outside the children's hospital. On the other hand, we know that COVID-19 does not lead to hospitalization in children very often. So why would there be a large number of cars outside the biggest children's hospital in Wuhan for um, COVID-19? On the other hand, that happened at precisely the same time as the annual RSV spike. So, yeah, not surprising. I, I think that was, to be polite, kind of um, an unexamined piece of work, and people are giving it far too much credence in reporting it uncritically. As you may well appreciate, that's one of the problems with this flood of science we've been getting. Most of it is being posted as preprints before it's been reviewed. And I think that one might not fare so well at the hands of critical reviewers. Okay, well, the substance of your book is that the pandemic, quote, should never have happened. So what steps were missed? What steps should have been taken? Well, once it did jump to humans, I mean, as we all know now, it's a pretty slippery virus. Um, I talked to every epidemiologist I know, and they were all saying, well, yeah, I mean, the minute they recognized they had a cluster of undiagnosed uh, pneumonia, um, they could have, you know, contained everybody. They could have, you know, isolated them. Well, you know, they did with the with the cases that they recognized. Um, but the trouble is that for some reason um, they refused to admit, even though the doctors knew it. At least certainly by late December, the doctors knew because they were getting family clusters um, of infection. The doctors knew it was it was spreading person to person. And and I think there was just a lot of reluctance locally to admit they had a problem on their hands, you know. So, okay, well, let's take a short commercial, commercial break. Once again, you, you, you are listening to Science Fantastic. with Professor Michio Kaku. With us today is Deborah McKenzie. She's a science journalist, writes for New Scientist magazine. Well, let's continue our discussion. We talked about the origins of the coronavirus. However, there's still a controversy about the role that the World Health Organization played. Some critics say that the WHO was late in terms of this virus were laid in terms of saying that it could be communicated person to person. And that's important because for many a week, people thought that it only stayed in the animal kingdom. But no, it's been hopping from, from bats and whatever to humans for weeks before that. And as a consequence, we missed an opportunity. But what are your thoughts? Well, as I was um, starting to say, um, the virus spreads person to person, obviously. Um, the doctors in Wuhan knew that by the end of December. But for some reason, the authorities um, sort of downplayed that and said, oh, well, maybe a bit in families, but we have no evidence it really spreads person to person. I think I think they were scared of scaring people, really. I mean, you know, China has bad memories of the SARS epidemic. They didn't want to say there was another one back, maybe. I don't know. But for two or three weeks, they, they didn't admit that the virus went person to person. Now, the WHO, and I know there were some people there who kind of went, well, you know, um, really? Because the case numbers are rising. Um, but the thing is, they don't have the power to go in and look. Um, the national sort of authority in this is, is absolute. A, a nation state has sovereignty 
over diseases on its territory, even though those diseases can then threaten the rest of the world. And the WHO can't say, um, that's very nice. Can we come in and, and talk to your doctors, please? They, they can't. Um, just China can just say no. All they can do is be really diplomatic and, and, and hope that the Chinese keep giving them information. Um, and, and when people accuse them of being slow to react, look, the WHO is doing everything it could. If it can't do more, it's because its member states, um, including the United States, as well as China and the others, um, have refused to give it the power to do any more than that. Okay, and what about the role of the Chinese government itself? Apparently, some whistleblowers in China have just disappeared. That's right. They just have disappeared off the face of the earth. No one knows where they went. Another person who also went against the authorities eventually died of the coronavirus and became a national hero, at least an underground national hero in China. So what are your thoughts about the fact that the Chinese were not just less than open to discussing the virus, but were openly trying to stop it. And even though they had a quarantine on Hunan itself, they allowed thousands, tens of thousands of people to leave Hunan to go to the West. And so some people are saying that maybe it was a deliberate infection of the West by the Chinese government. But what are your thoughts? Well, China took a pretty big economic hit itself from that thing. I think there was, um, well, it's an authoritarian government. If, if people do things that the government has told them not to do, you know, yes, there are going to be disappearances. I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's awful. But it happens with a lot of other things in China as well. But to jump from that to deliberately infecting the West, I mean, you know, you'd have to say, well, you know, they deliberately infected themselves, too, and took a huge hit to the GDP. I don't think China would do that on purpose. Once again, you are listening to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Well, was it, isn't it true that scientists were caught pretty much uh, with their pants down when this virus first hit. We, did, we still are debating about masks. Uh, we, we're still debating about how infectious it is. But some people have said that maybe it's still more infectious than the flu. The flu kills tens of thousands of people. But now we are establishing numbers. So compared to the flu, how does COVID-19 rack up in terms of how infectious it is and also its fatality rate. Well, I don't think there's very much debate about that. They established fairly early in this pandemic that the um, basic reproduction number, the number of cases that um, um, any one case is likely to transmit the virus to, uh, is between two and three. Now, your average flu virus is between one and two. I mean, it's just barely enough to sustain an epidemic. Um, it's just because it spreads so quickly that so many people get it during the yearly flu epidemic. Um, basically, uh, this is a lot more infectious than flu and about 10 times as lethal. The best guess, I mean, we can't have precise numbers um, until it's been around for a while longer, but all the people I talk to say, Matt, nah, it's about 1%, maybe a little bit more. But the one big unknown about this is that there seems to be a lot of um, unevenness in, in, in spread. Some people don't spread it at all. Some people spread it a lot. They're called super spreaders. And that makes it um, a little bit more difficult to get your hands around. If you get one super spreader after you've maybe brought the epidemic under control, then you can suddenly have a huge outbreak again. Now, the governments of the world are saying that we should separate six feet from other people. Uh, droplets fall to the ground within six feet. But now there's a huge debate about aerosols. That is, papers from MIT and other physics laboratories have stated that droplets the size of a blood cell, tiny droplets like what you find in perfume, can spread 20 feet, not just 6 feet, even though, of course, most of the droplets fall within 6 feet. Some of the droplets can infect an entire room. I mean, think of perfume. Perfume will fill up an entire, uh, an entire room with ease. So what are your thoughts about really how infectious is this and are masks really sufficient or not sufficient? 
Well, math has to be based on actual empirical observation, uh, with all due respect to MIT and physicists. Um, oh, you guys base your stuff on empirical observations, too, so I, I shouldn't say that. But um, the observation with this virus is that all the evidence is that it spreads in droplets. And generally speaking, it doesn't spread via aerosol. Now, we know viruses that do. Measles, for example. I mean, if you walk into a room full of people who are not immune to measles, everybody's going to get it. It's amazing. I mean, we talked about the um, basic reproduction number, the, the contagiousness of, of COVID-19 being like between two and three. Measles is about 16. I mean, and that moves in aerosols. You know, you'd know it if this thing moved primarily in aerosols. It's mostly droplet. It behaves like it's mostly droplet. There are some procedures in hospitals for example, inserting a ventilator into a very sick patient that can generate aerosols, um, and that puts medical staff at more risk than maybe the general public is. And in that case, yes, you do get spread. The difference between aerosols is that they float on the air, whereas a droplet, as you say, will usually fall to earth, you know, within a couple of meters. So, you know, it, it changes the way you manage the, uh, the illness. And um, there's really not a lot of evidence that there is significant aerosol spread for COVID-19. Well, how do we explain the fact that super spreaders, as you mentioned, super spreaders can infect between 50 to 100 other people? Uh, something just came out this week saying that in one church, they've been able to document by contact tracing 55, 55 individuals who have now tested positive for the coronavirus from one individual. This individual was not in the choir, not shouting, not screaming, not mm -hmm singing hymns, but just sitting in a church, infecting everybody in sight. And bridge club games. One person playing bridge can infect the entire bridge club. How could that be if everything drops within six feet? with Professor Michio Kaku. Welcome back. Once again, our special guest today is Deborah McKenzie. Well, we're, we're continuing to learn more and more about how infectious this disease is, the fatality rate, and there's a debate within the scientific community about how it spreads in the air. For the most part, the viruses in droplets do fall to the floor within six feet. But now we have real data from contact tracing showing that super spreaders can spread it to 50 to 100 people. In one instance, we had a bridge club where one woman infected pretty much the entire bridge club. We know exactly where everyone was sitting in that bridge club game. Now we also have results coming at just this week from one super spreader spreading the virus to 55 other members of the congregation. Uh, not coughing, uh, no singing, just sit, simply sitting with other people infecting the entire room. Therefore, some people are saying that maybe aerosols, that maybe it's being spread in the air, for the most part, as droplets, they fall to the floor within six feet. But in some situations, you can infect the entire room. What are your thoughts? Well, that's why I mentioned super spreaders. These are um, not that common, but when they happen, they obviously are doing something different. Um, in some cases, it's just because of the premises they're in. I mean, for example, we learned early in this pandemic that being on a cruise boat is a pretty good way to spread the virus um, because you've got a, an air recirculation system that is recirculating air from all the different cabins. You keep people apart, but, but the air is moving in a particular way that, that tends to keep things going. Um, maybe there was some kind of air conditioning system in this church that, that tended to pick up droplets and keep them moving. I can't say without knowing more about it, and neither can the scientists involved. Um, one worrying possibility, of course, could be that um, some variants of the virus uh, are more prone to form aerosols than others. Now, typically this doesn't happen with viruses. Um, flu spreads in droplets. Um, we know plenty of different varieties of flu, and we just never see aerosol spread, really, to speak of. Um, but then this is a different virus. Who knows? Maybe one or two patients will get a particular variant of it. I mean, these viruses mutate a lot within a single patient. You can get variants of them, um, very many kinds of, of, of different sort of mutations of the virus within one patient. That's normal with an RNA virus. 
and maybe some of them just happen to form aerosols better. This is stuff we don't know yet, and that's one of the reasons scientists would just love to get their hands on, you know, the viruses that, that are behind these occasional super-spreading events to find out what's going on. Okay, well, also, let's get into the substance of your book about the future. First of all, you say that in some sense it's inevitable that we're going to have another pandemic. I mean, after all, roughly 60% or so of diseases hop over from the animal kingdom. And you mentioned specifically the Nipah virus. And we should be aware of the fact that there are many candidates for the next pandemic. What are your thoughts? Well, there are many coronaviruses left, and those bats haven't had a chance yet. Um, and, uh, for example, we've now had two coronavirus epidemics. Uh, one didn't spread so well, and, and because of a global effort coordinated, by the way, by the WHO in 2003, we managed to stop that one in its tracks. It took a lot of work, but, but we managed to stop that one and, and wipe it out. Uh, now we have this one, COVID-19. Interestingly, uh, if you have antibodies, if you have an immune reaction to SARS because you were exposed to it back then, that's not going to help you against COVID. So that tells us that uh, two viruses from the same species of bat um, can cause disease in humans, and immunity to one won't give you immunity to the other. There are more coronaviruses out there uh, in those bats. So, um, you know, this could happen again. We could get, you know, COVID-22 or COVID-25 in subsequent years. But then there are a lot of other viruses that scientists are worried about. There's bird flu. You know, people talk about, oh, well, when the bird flu pandemic happened, the bird flu pandemic hasn't happened. That virus hasn't learned to transmit between people yet. If it ever does, you know, we could very well be in a lot of serious trouble. And scientists have been warning about that for years, but we're not much more. We have a bit more science done on it. We've done some vaccine development, but we're not much better prepared for it, really, um, than we were when the alarm was first sounded in 2004. And then there is, as you say, NEPA. And people are worried about that because it's got a huge mortality rate. It's, it's as high in some places where it's been observed as 75% of people who catch it. What really is scary, though, is that, well, again, it's one that's carried this time by a different kind of bat, a fruit bat. Um, people get it from them one way or another. Um, either the uh, uh, in one place uh, uh, the pigs were eating bat droppings and, and then the people were getting it from the pigs. There's a related virus in Australia where horses are eating bat droppings and people are getting it from horses. Uh, and then there's uh, bats who are sort of taking taking sips out of um, a kind of sap that humans tap from trees and, and sort of leaving the virus in that, and people are getting it that way. Um, and people thought, well, okay, it's got to come direct from the bat. This is not spreading between people. It's not really, you know. Except just recently they've noticed, well, actually, um, where you have cases, you sometimes get a little bit of transmission. You know, one or two other people will catch it from a person, and it's spreading in respiratory droplets. And as we all know, those can be hard to control, that kind of disease. So that's why people are worried. It's, it's kind of starting to learn to transmit between people, and we certainly don't want a virus with that kind of death rate doing that kind of thing. Okay, Deborah. once again, your book is called COVID-19, The Pandemic That Never Should Have Happened and How to Stop the Next One on Sale Soon. 